Welcome to another edition of Reaching Out. I'm Gravy Floyd, President of Local 237 Teamsters. With us once again, we have a very special guest, uh, our Queens District Attorney, Melinda Katz. Uh, she made history in January 2020 when she became the first woman to hold the office of Queens District Attorney. She has a long career in public service beginning in 1994 when she was elected to the New York State Assembly. Melinda Katz went on to become the city, a city council member from 2002 uh, to 2009, where she served as chair of the Influential Land Use Committee. In 2019, she was elected the 19th borough president of Queens. D.A. Katz was born and raised in Queens. She graduated with honors from the University of Massachusetts and received a Juris Doctorate from St. John's University School of Law. District Attorney lives in Forest Hills with her two sons. Welcome to Reaching Out. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, uh, Greg, and thank you for the work that you do on behalf of the city. You know, your your uh, union makes the city run. Uh, and uh, we uh, thank, thank you. you for doing that so well, representing your constituents. Thank you very much. Now, you have made um, taking down gangs, drug operations, and gun trafficking rings, a priority of your office. Tell us how you do this. Well, yeah, I mean, I have made uh, taking down uh, the gangs a priority, and we've done several takedowns over the years. They require long-term investigations, and they require really the resources in order to do it. So, for instance, last year, uh, we took 33 gang members in one day, uh, arrested them for conspiracy for murder, conspiracy for attempted murder, conspiracy for uh, CPW holding of, uh, of guns and weapons. And the theory behind that, and, and we did that, you know, in Queensbridge and Ravenswood, we do that in Western Queens, we've done it all over the borough. And the theory behind that is, you know, at least in Southeast Queens, there was a murder of um, a, a 15 year old, Amir Griffin. And that was before I became the DA. Uh, and that was at uh, um, Baisley. And, you know, at the end of the day, the question I asked was, how did we get the gun? Who bought the gun? Who sold the gun? How was the gun hidden? What happened? Why weren't people told? Uh, there were a lot of witnesses there. We couldn't get anyone to testify at first. So we did a long-term investigation on the gang activity in the community. And there was at least five murders in that conspiracy charge. You know, someone was murdered, then someone was retaliated against. And uh, there were shootings involved in it. Uh, and so I think it's important. And since then, the numbers have gone down. I will tell you that in New York City, murder has gone down 11 percent. In Queens County, it's gone down 58 percent. Um, and I think there's something to be said for making sure that the gangs understand that it's not happening here in Queens County. And if it does, they'll be held accountable. Um, and so we do uh, long term investigations. It's not only about gang activity, it's also about getting the guns off the street. Uh, we have about two to 3,000 prosecutions of gun activity uh, going on on any given day in this office. Uh, and we, and we uh, investigate not only the iron guns that are being sold in Virginia and North Carolina and South Carolina, they're being sold legally, then they're being brought up the iron pipeline on the East Coast sold to our children here in Queens County. Uh, we investigate that, but we also investigate ghost guns, which, um, you know, out of the entire city of ghost guns that have been found and retrieved, we have retrieved 36% of them out of Queens County. So it has to be a priority for anyone who wants to lower the murder rate and lower the shooting rate in, Queens, in, in the city of New York. Uh, have you ever caught, arrested, any of the traffickers who bring the guns up through the pipeline, not just the people who buy them, have you ever been uh, able to get somebody maybe in the source of Virginia or somewhere? Has that so, been done? Mr. Floyd, I will tell you this. I am a very patient person. And so it is very easy to get the one-off arrests off the street of someone who has a gun or is in, in possession of the guns. Mm -hmm. Our investigations are long-term because I insist on getting the suppliers. I insist okay. on getting those who are from the other states who will buy them legally. Because remember, you can buy them off the sure. internet, you can buy them at a gun show, mm -hmm. and then they bring them here. Um, and if we're not getting the suppliers, 
then it's just going to be someone else taking the place of that individual, either selling or using the gun on the street. Okay. So um, the long-term investigations require patience, requires resources, um, and I have both in order to combat these crimes. Okay, very good. Your office has a conviction integrity unit. How does that unit work? So we have, um, when I first came into office, I immediately hired someone from the Innocence Project uh, whose only job is to investigate past convictions. I do not think the criminal justice system can be that arrogant to think that mistakes were never made. So we, um, so they can, anybody can go online, uh, QD, on our QDA website, queensda.org, um, and uh, apply for our Conviction Integrity Unit. We just reached our 100th vacating of convictions about two or three weeks ago. We now are at 100, 101, and 102. Um, about 15, 16 of them are a result of long-term investigations. In other words, new evidence that was found. Um, and um, you know, thousands of documents, um, dozens of witnesses re-interviewed, uh, some of them had um, witnesses that recanted their testimony. 86 of the vacating of those convictions were because they were based um, almost 100% on a police officer's testimony who later on was found guilty of perjury or falsification of documents. And so they were 86 convictions that really, no matter what, I could no longer have any faith in those convictions. And so we vacated those. The others were vacated, like I said, after long-term investigations. You know, to see someone who did not commit a crime or that we believe that jury would have found a different judgment had they known of the new evidence, go into a courtroom, uh, literally change beforehand from a, a prison suit to a business suit, and go into that courtroom and have their judgment vacated and their indictment vacated um, is is an amazing thing that that we do um, citywide. But you know, from a personal perspective, I can't think of anything worse than doing uh, time for a crime that new evidence shows is questionable. That's that's astounding. It's really astounding just to listen to how many convictions have been vacated. And the circumstances that led to those vacations is uh, people being vacated. Um, another focus of your office has been combating domestic violence. Yeah, we're a very diverse community here in Queens County, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners know that. We have about 190 countries here represented, about 200 languages. Each one, um, you know, I'm responsible for, and quite honestly, 49 percent of those individuals that are residents who fill out. The census, 49% are born in another country, and they have chosen not to make the United States their home, not to make New York State their home, not to make New York City their home. They've chosen to make Queens County their home, and that's 49% of the residents. And with that comes, I think, a very heavy responsibility of safety and reaching out to the families and making sure that they know they have a safe place here in Queens County. And domestic violence is no exception to that. There's a family justice center here. Uh, in fact, uh, D.A. Willis uh, from Georgia just came last week in order to see our family justice center. And it was my honor to show her around and to uh, be the host here. Um, and so we reach out. We found it particularly difficult to reach out to victims of domestic violence mm -hmm. during COVID. So I created a 24-7 hotline. That hotline is 718. 286-4410. At any time or day at night, someone can call that hotline in Queens and say, I'm a victim. I need help. They can either do one of two things. They can ask for services. You know, I'm here now. I need help right now. What do I do? Um, or they can ask to speak to an ADA if they want to prosecute and press charges. So we um, are very diligent in making sure that victims know they have a place to go and to come to for help from every community. We try to be accessible in almost every language that there is uh, out there in Queens County, which is several, uh, as I said, a couple of hundred. 
Um, and uh, we do forums, we go to public workshops, and we also do forums in places where if you're abused, um, you can actually go to, right? So some families in, and in different areas uh, of the county, um, you know, their, their abuser will only allow them, for instance, to go to the library with their child. So we go to the libraries and we reach out in the community in which we represent. I have tried uh, very hard every day to put a face to the DA's office. The first time people see me should not be when I'm coming to get them. The first time someone sees the DA should be when I'm trying to keep them out of the courtroom, especially our youth, especially people who really want to do good. Um, and they should know that the DA has a face and that my staff has a face and that we want to help. And, and you mentioned that Queens has over 200 different uh, dialects, languages, um, yep. nationalities. Yep. Uh, I remember going, I, I always tell people, Francis Lewis Boulevard travels through every community in Queens. It turns, it goes right, north, south, east, west. And if you travel Francis Lewis Boulevard, if you're able to stay on that path, you will find everybody in the world. You will visit the world going through Francis Lewis Boulevard. You know, so, and, uh, yeah. they can get, you know, baklava from one corner. They can get rice and beans on another corner. They can get, you know, it's really an amazing place to live. It's an amazing mm -hmm. responsibility to represent. And I take that to heart every day. People have put their faith into this county for their safety. I'm, uh, I'm and good. they've also put their faith into this county for fairness. And you can do both. You can have fairness in the courtroom and safety on the streets. And as I always say, if they tell you you can't, they're lying to you because you can. I remember growing up in uh, Queens when my parents moved from Brooklyn to Queens when I was 11. And we lived there for, so I got married and I still lived in Queens, lived in Bayside. Wow. Uh, it's a, just a beautiful, beautiful borough to live in, the beautiful schools. I, I had the fondest memories growing up in uh, Southeast Queens. August Martin High School. Ah, I went to Hillcrest. Uh, Hillcrest was uh, over there. You had Hillcrest, Jamaica, Thomas Edison. Yep. And uh, now they had the other school, the uh, health, the the um, the health and high high. Um, I mean, yeah, health and so so right. So Jamaica yeah. Hospitals now like Jamaica uh, High School is yeah. now like five high schools in one. Right, right. But they have another high school on 164th Street, right next to. Queens Hospital Center. Ah, a high school there now that, that exists. So it's all in that area. Yeah. Beautiful. It's all in that area. Beautiful growing up. I would meet all the children going to high school. We travel on the same bus and people would get off. They would take different buses. And every day it was the same routine for, for three, four years. And we yep. all got to know each other going to different schools and have these conversations. It was interesting. The, the hub, the bus terminal in Jamaica would be where all the trouble gathered after school. And I stayed away from that. I got on the bus and I went around that. And I remember hearing horror stories. I stayed away from that altogether. Right. Well, cool. we try to keep it as safe as we can now. But you're listening to Reaching Out. I'm Gravy Floyd, President of Local 237. Teamsters, very special guest is um, District Attorney Melinda Katz. Uh, what steps have been taken to help victims of domestic violence since so we, we mentioned your centers and DA Willis came to visit from Georgia uh, to see. Yeah. So she didn't come all this way for nothing. You have something yeah. special there. We yeah. do. It's a family justice center is an amazing place. You can walk in off the street at any time and get the help you need and get the help you need not only for you, but for your children as well. Um, you can go in, you can talk to um, you know, the social workers and people for any help you need. There's a children's room with toys and games and everything so that the kids feel comfortable while they're waiting. They're not sitting in some, you know, uh, barren office uh, waiting for you. Um, and so they, they are very good at delivering the services, very good at figuring out places uh, for people to live, uh, and very good for creating a safe environment for people to discuss their issues. I think people are afraid sometimes that when they um, are victims, uh, you know, that, that all of a sudden they have to make all these decisions at that moment. And it's really not about that. It's about making sure that p victims feel safe, that their children are safe, and that, we, that they are part of the decisions um, of how something progresses. 
Uh, and I think that that's why um, DA Willis came in. Uh, and, and really, they do unbelievable work here in Queens County, and they do it throughout the city in domestic violence. I mean, it is something that everyone, I believe, can stand behind. Um, and to figure out the different languages to, to deliver the services in different cultures, different you know ways that people have, it's important, right? If you come from a different culture, it's also important that you feel safe in that environment. And so we are very responsive to that. The Family Justice Center is very responsive to that. And we urge anyone who feels um, that they are in need of those services uh, to come. Where, where's the center located? Uh, Queens Boulevard and Union Turnpike. Queens Boulevard and Union Turnpike. Okay. And like I said, the hotline here is 718-286-4410. So they can always call on that too. Okay. And can they go on your website and get the information also? I assume, yes. You can go on the website and get the information too. All right. Retail theft has caused many stores to close or put the merchandise under lock and key. Uh, like you can't get a razor blade, you can't get deodorant. You can't. And it's unfortunate that we're living in a society that if you want deodorant, you have to. And you go to the um, the pharmacy, you have to get a lock and key just to get deodorant. So, well, and then they announce it on on the air, right? Then they yeah. say over the loudspeaker, "Deodorant wanted in yeah, aisle Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Press the button. Uh, what is your office doing to combat this wave, this crime wave? So the first thing we got to realize is there's a distinction between shoplifting, <laughs> robbery, assault, and then issues that started happening in Southeast Queens and now have extended to the rest of the borough about, uh, you know, individuals that were harassing people walking in. You know, there were issues uh, in, in Jamaica about people who were like coming in with their mothers with the kids, the baby strollers, the whole the whole bit. Um, and we needed a way to warn people, listen, you, if you if you pet, if you do petty theft, if you shoplift, if you rob, you assault people in the stores, you're going to be held accountable here in Queens. But at the same time, I wanted a way to give people a second chance for those individuals that weren't exactly doing that or who were coming back after they shoplift. They get a DAT, they go to the precinct, they get fingerprinted, and within an hour, they're back at the same store. And you know what it's like, Greg. You are you called up yeah. someone to get the toothpaste and the conditioner out of the lock and key. You're waiting online to pay your bill with the stuff you had to call someone to get. And someone walks in with a knapsack and fills it up. You're still waiting to pay your bill. They walk out with all this stuff, and you're still waiting to pay your bill. And so I can tell you that murder in Queens County is down 58%. I can tell you shootings are down 35%. But if you are standing on that line in that CVS or Walgreens or whatever, it's 100% to you. And I don't blame you. It makes doesn't make you feel safe. It makes you feel like you're paying for stuff while other people are walking in and out. So we created what's called in Queens County a trespass affidavit. So you come to the store you're a recidivist, which by the way, they say about 500 people are committing like the thousands of crimes that happen every day. It's the same people. Mm -hmm. You call 911 and in that police precinct in Queens County, they have what's called a trespass affidavit. That has been formed um, and printed by our office with the police department, but we've checked the, the legal aspect of it. You are given a trespass affidavit and that affidavit said, I'm the retail store. I am revoking your privilege to be in my store. Oh. And you will be arrested the next time you come. That's so that does, right. So that does two things. Number yeah. one, you don't have to wait for someone to steal again from you. Number two, it gives them a second chance, right? And that's yeah. really the important part. And I will tell you that out of a hundred, so we'd started with pilot precincts, three pilot precincts. Uh, we just expanded it to the rest of the borough. Out of the three pilot precincts, 142 business locations joined our trespass affidavit program. Um, 83 individuals were given trespass affidavits out of this pilot project, and seven people came back. So seven people came back. They were arrested, and we vetted those seven for mental health illness or drug addiction to try and see if we can help them from coming back, right? There's a reason 
that they're there. Yeah. Um, and so it does two things. It gives people a warning and it allows us to get them help. Now, so let's let's take a oh, Walgreens, CVS. Uh, if you have those in the borough and somebody makes out the complaint in one Walgreens or CVS, does that cover all the Walgreens and CVS in that borough? No, it does no. not. Just it the individual. individual store. It's an individual store. It's a trespass affidavit for that store. And yeah. I will remind everyone, this doesn't replace the arrest for the act for an actual crime, right. right? This is simply a warning. You know, look, you shoplifted from me this morning. You're now back because, you know, uh, you got out because it was a DAT. Sure. If you come back again, this is an affidavit that says you're going to be sure. arrested. So they're yeah. getting a second chance while still keeping some control and power by the retail establishment. And I think that's important. You know, we have situations where workers in these stores are getting hurt because they're trying to, to protect the merchandise and they're trying to protect other people in their sure. stores. Sure. Um, and so this allows the police to be involved, gives a warning, but does not replace the arrest for a robbery or petty larceny or an assault that takes place inside the store. It's, it's, it's very interesting. I've never, I've never heard of it. And, and, and I like the, the concept. I, I just, I, I really like it. It's just, it's just innovative. Uh, we, we will have you come back. Uh, we have just about one minute left and we're going to give you that minute to talk about any initiative that you, you have that we didn't cover anything that you have that we didn't cover. I think I really want to thank you and your workers and, and everyone who makes the city run again. I think if I could think of one topic from a, a DA's perspective that I would want your listeners to know, it's, uh, you know, drug overdoses have, have exponentially increased. A lot of it is due to fentanyl. Fentanyl is synthetic. Uh, it's not grown. It's it's made. So uh, it is responsible in Queens County for 78 percent of the overdose deaths in Queens County. And what your listeners really should know is that 50% of those individuals are over the age of 50. Okay. I'll tell you again, overdoses in Queens County, 50% are over the age of 50. So all of the pills that people think they're buying that look just like their prescription pills, but they're buying them on the street or whatever they're, however they're doing it, uh, uh, any other type of drug, they look very real, but a lot of them are laced. So be very careful. Um, it is uh, an initiative that we are proud that we are working on. Uh, we wish that we had less business in that area. Um, but people should know that just because something looks like uh, an oxycodone or looks like a Xanax or looks like, a, 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 you know, any type of antidepressive pills, unless you get it from a drugstore, it doesn't mean it is. What's the percentage you're getting over 50? 50% of the people 50%. that are dying of overdoses are over the age of 50. Wow, that's that's astounding. At least in uh, Queens County. I'm not, I don't know. In Queens rest, County. Yeah, I don't that's know. That's astounding. Um, that's all the time we have for this segment of Reaching Out. And a very special guest was Queens District Attorney Melinda Katz. You're welcome to come back anytime that you want to convey a message to our listeners uh, or or anybody. Just, just call us up and you're welcome to come back anytime. This was I very helpful. I learned, I learned a lot during this interview. And I thank you for taking the time to uh, meet with us. Thank you. Continue your great work. Okay. Uh, thank you, Phyllis, too. Bye-bye. All right.